walk into the space where creators never line the positive and intellectual collab of open minds. The sharing and learning from one another, it's a vibe. We can watch a podcast on the mic. Subscribe, educators spitting bars. I guess you didn't know I'm multifaceted and humble, taking off life goals. The classroom is my comfort zone where I plant and sow. Seeds of knowledge, compassion, empathy, and hope. Reading is the key to unlocking your potential. Countless benefits, including cognitive and mental. Regardless of the genre, books are highly influential. Go get yours, I'll get mine. Make you strive. Monumental. Come rock with me and get down to this new jam. Between my friends, I had a very simple plan. Educate the masses through books and life lessons. It's a grand slam. I'm out. Sala Falava and Kiona Itifano. Welcome to the Reads of Rossa podcast, fam. It is episode 80 today. Woohoo! <laughs> Can't believe it, man. Episode 80. I am so excited to introduce today's guest. He is a professional rugby player who hails from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and is of Maori and Samoan descent. He is the current Hawks Bay and Wana Pacifica halfback. Welcome to the show, Ereatara Enari. Woo! How are you, bro? Hello, Rosa. Good, thank you. How are you? I'm good, bro. Man. Thank you so much for coming through. I appreciate it. I know you're a busy man. So this this means a lot, man. Episode 80. Oh, that's what's up. <laughs> um, actually my first podcast. So yeah. That's your first podcast. I, oh. Bro, it's an honor. It is an honor to have you here then. Uh, well, before we get into it, I guess everyone wants to know who are you? Um, please give a brief introduction. Shout out your iwi, your villages. Go ahead. Um, yeah, to to Tahira, Tenara Tato Katoa, um, to Tato Nei Atua, um, Nana Nei Homai, Nana Noka Tango, Morera Kuroria Katoa Nei Matapu. My lord is with Pua Mawa, Malilangi Mama. Um, into our uh, Japanese audience, Hajime Mashte, Bokua Inari Des, Dozo Hiroshiko Nigashimas. Thank you, um, Rosa, for having me um, winging it today. So I'm really excited for um, what we've got um, going on. I have um, watched a couple of your podcasts, and um, one of them, my mate, um, Johnny Fauli a little while ago, which um, shouldn't take too many tips from that fella, but <laughs> um, I was really excited to just share or, you know, I don't actually talk a lot, but when it's um, intentional times, I'm pretty happy to um, tell him more. So thank you for having me up. Oh, man, I think the audience, I, I feel like the fam's going to be super impressed. Multilingualism, you know, all those different languages you're speaking there. Come on, uh, bro. Yeah, the facade, but touch base here and there. <laughs> oh, well, we'll, well, we're going to get into that more. Um, mm -hmm. Man, that was great. Thank you so much for your introduction. I guess, um, yeah, man, getting straight into it. Uh, obviously, you're an athlete. Uh, what are your first memories? Uh, of playing sports as a youngster? Um, first, mem first memories for me go back to primary school. Um, and then that, that time in primary school we had, um, I think we might have played around 10 to 12 different sports. Um, and it was, all, it was all driven by our, our caretaker. He, he coached the majority of those sports. His name was Turomia. And um, yeah, so back then I was I was in all sorts, and we did a bit of swimming, water polo. Um, I was actually mostly trying to stay afloat in that in that time. Um, cricket, softball, touch, rugby, league. It was just um, what they wanted us to do was just have a have a crack at anything. So um, yeah, for us that was a really exciting time. Um, it was primary school, and we just got to sort of dip the toe in anything that we wanted to try. So. Yeah, sports has been a huge part of my upbringing, um, and it's yeah, one of the things that I just really loved to do when I was younger. Mm. You know, who were some of your role models, like, you know, playing sport? Uh, obviously, you then went into rugby, but did you have role models across different codes or, you know, different sports or from different sports teams? Uh, or maybe not even athletes, like just community folks? Community folks, oh, probably like um, just growing up, definitely um, 
So our role models were so well my brother for starters and my older brother Brian. Um, you know, like having an older brother, anyone knows who has siblings is you kind of just follow them everywhere, eh? And so whatever he did, I tried to do and um, he was someone that I chased all through my childhood, which being a year older than me, I got to sort of test myself, um, you know, mostly against him, which he would put me in my place, and then I would learn from that and get better. So <laughs> I'm probably first of all, I'd, I'd like to say my, my brother is one of the biggest role models in my life. Um, and I know that you know, where I am now, doing the things that I'm doing, I wouldn't be here without um, him leading the way um, in front of me. So, yeah. Uh... Right. That's solid as, you know, um, I was wondering what kind of student you were. I mean, imagine playing sports. It's your comfort zone, man. You know, you're with your friends. You're just doing the things you love. But inside the classroom or at school, what kind of student were you? Um, I'm heavy introvert. So, oh. yeah, very proud, heavy introvert. So I was that one sort of sitting right at the back of the class, just observing and watching everyone. Um, you know, in a way, you know, there's pros and cons, but um, I probably like observed and watched people um, do things and get them wrong so that hopefully I wouldn't get it wrong. And that was one of my biggest fears back at school was standing up in front of the class and getting it wrong, um, mm. which, is, you know, a lot of us probably had that at school. So um, I don't know, it was something that I guess I struggled with at school, but it's also something that I grew out of. Um, mm at some point um, and it's something that my parents always tried to drill out of me was go and try something and get it wrong and be okay with that but mm. so yeah, I was sort of just sitting back and waiting to try and get it right the first time. Yeah. At what age did you start to move out of that phase because I, I totally re it resonates like what you're saying like I I totally mm. get that eh? like but what age, because I know that uh, later on we'll talk about it, you know, you did, uh, you, you're you a leader, like you're a leader on the field, right? Obviously in the position that you play, but um, just listening to what you're saying, at what age, was it like your teen age years or was it after uh, um, as you moved on to university? Yeah, it was quite late, um, like probably more university and mm. even even late university like it's it's not something that um that happens very quickly um and it comes with experience um the more experience i had so when i did move to university in christchurch we were living away from home for the first proper time and i spent six years down there um just living with other players um friends and doing our own thing apart from our family so that was probably a time where I started to learn to just take control of, you know, my own happenings, and I had to step into that space and get things wrong. Um, so it wasn't something that happened when I was young. Um, it was something I grew out of with the more life experience that I got. Mm. And uh, yeah, and and so even probably just last year was, or this year that's just gone, has been the biggest year of growth in that space. And. Um, just taking responsibility of stepping out and um, leading in a different way than I used to. Mm. Mm. You know, you're both Māori and Samoan, um, two strong, rich cultures. Which of the languages are you more comfortable conversing in? Um, most comfortable in Māori. So um, still very... Um, new to trying to learn my Samoan language again. Um, back when we were younger, we went to Aonga for Samoa, mm. and that was when we were in kindy. So, and then um, I only learned recently the reason why we kind of transitioned to full immersion Maori learning was, um, so dad was telling us at the time, um, te reo Maori was a dying language. Mm. Um, and it was still in that phase of, decline. So when we were younger, um, you know, as, as proud as our mom and dad is, he prioritized our Maori tongue. And, um, you know, the reasoning behind that, uh, he just told us recently was, you know, like Samoa will always be there. And Samoa is very strong. Um, but at the time, Te Reo Maori and Te Ao Maori was in a very steady decline. Mm -hmm. so, 
a blessing for us in that space is that he, he gave us the space to push into our Māori tanga. And you know, the majority of what I hold now um, came from when I was back then in primary school and intermediate, which are the most important learning phases, especially for language. Um, so yeah, just a huge blessing that um, we got to lay that foundation um, of our Māori tongue. And um, so as true as what he said was that, you know, now I, I have the opportunity to step into my um, Samoan space and um, especially with things like um, Manu Samoa, it's just a huge um, opportunity to immerse again and um, yeah, find that other side to me that's been lagging a little bit. <laughs> that's a cool story, man. And I, seriously, that is such a cool story. Um, just the importance of language and keeping our languages alive and that connection. Um, you know, does your dad speak, uh, you know, te reo? Does, is, you know? Yeah, my dad is, um, yeah, he's a very accomplished, what do you call it, linguist. Oh. <laughs> The word up but um he's very good with language loves language and um so he grew up in Samoa he's fluent in Samoan and then when he came to New Zealand um he met mum at university and saw that all the the Maori students were getting sent to a certain line and they were getting sent to learn to be Maori teachers mm. and he was over here he was a bit fair skinned so he was with the Parangis on the side he's like no nah, I'm going over there <laughs> so he followed all the all the Maori students and ended up um, learning to be a Maori teacher. Um, so he's been teaching Maori for up to twenty years now. Um, oh. And so yeah, fluent in Samoan and Maori, and he also dabbles with you know the Tongan and um, Fijian because he went to Wesley and he grew up around all sorts of um, island cultures. But. Oh. He's very inspirational to us and in the spaces that he he walks amongst um, just how connected he is in the cultural space. It's pretty awesome, yeah. Wow. And so in the home, was it, uh, were you all speaking Māori or was that uh, at the kura? Like what, you know, was it English at home or was it a mix of English and Māori? It was actually um, a lot of English, now that I think of it. Um, a lot of English at home, um, Māori at school. And from memory, I don't remember us speaking a lot of Samoan. Mm. Um, yeah, we haven't actually had the time to sort of dive into the whys. And like, you know, just recently we are like telling Dad, like, oh, can you just speak more in Samoan and, you know, challenge us to figure out what you're saying and have that conversation, maybe even like half, half. And, but yeah, just from memory, probably more just um, just English at home or a bit mixture of Māori here and there, but not a whole lot, yeah. Mm. Can you talk about some of the uh, life lessons or just the values that your parents have instilled in you that have helped to mould you into the young man that you are today? <laughs> Um, it's a it's a pretty simple one for us is like it's simply God first um, in everything we do um, and yeah our upbringing it wasn't a religious one per se it was um, but it was always pointing towards Christ um, and our relationship with Jesus so um, it's like a concept these days that's kind of complicated eh? Um, right. Like, do you go to church or, you know, what does faith mean? Is there a difference or are they the same? But, um, you know, our, our focus and, and our faith is our relationship with our God. And, mm. um, and everything that we've done um, since growing up, little, um, moving from primary to intermediate or intermediate to our next phase, it was always done in prayer. And... Um, you know, following whatever God wants for our next phase. And when we trust that process, then it's just all good. Mm. Um, yeah, and that just flows on to everything that we do, every decision we want to make. Um, we always, you know, go to the source um, because then from there, how can you go wrong? Um, so that's been a huge pillar 
in, in all of our lives, um, me and my two brothers, because there's always a place to come back to when you're lost or if you've sort of gone off on your own tangent and it hasn't worked out, eh? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's something that will, will never leave us and that sort of leads us into whatever space we sort of want to head into next. Mm. How much of an impact uh, have your parents had um, in terms of decision-making, uh, you know, w as you were coming through as a rugby player and deciding, okay, this is the next step, this is the next step, this is the next step. Obviously, prayer is a huge part of that. I was wondering what impact mum and dad had on that. Yeah, um, I think first and foremost, they asked us what we want. Um, remember when we were, I think Brian and I were probably eight and seven, or even potentially younger, they had asked us, what do you want to do when you grow up? What's your, what's your dream job? Do you want to work or do you want to play? And it was a simple question as that, and yeah. Being kids, we're like, we want to play. Mm. You know? Why not? Like, is that an option? We'll take that. So from there, he said, okay, you want to play? Then we'll start planning towards that. And um, at that stage, we there were, we had a um, we had a soccer club down the road from our house, and they had so uh, our soccer fields have the the outline in front of the goalpost, um, and we had a little um, Chiefs rugby ball, the ones you could get from the claw machine. And he just um, lined us up in front of each other and we just, the old head it up, run it straight. <laughs> run it straight. <laughs> and um, mum would sit in the car and would get back and she's crying because <laughs> she knows each other up. I'd come back with a bleeding nose most times. Um, we'd do that um, most days or most weeks um, when we first decided we wanted to play rugby. Um, you know, dad's, dad's whole thing was, um, is this really what you want to do? Um, we'll do this until you decide yes or no. And, yeah, we just loved it. We loved playing. Um, and so that was the first steps they asked us. Um, and we proved that what we said was actually true. And then from there, it was um, sort of just guiding us into decisions through prayer, mm -hmm. showing us that prayer um, reaps fruits. And when you follow those fruits, then it's good for you. Um, yeah, and that was kind of the process that they just sort of taught us that, um, you know, first, first, yes, you have something that you want to do, but um, second is asking God, is that for you? And then if it is, then that's us. And then we're off. You know, I watched this interview. Oh, it's from uh, 2017, I think. I think you were uh, part of the, maybe it was the under 20s, heading off to, heading overseas for the competition. And your mum was interviewed and she talks about uh, your Māori heritage, uh, you know, Mauraku, weaponry. She talks about kapahaka and things like that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Like, uh, were you learning? Kapahaka in school, uh, you know, where, was it um, family, community uh, gatherings? Uh, yeah. yeah um, back at um, back in school when we were going to school in Gisborne, um, so we did we did all of our we did twelve years in Auckland, and then we moved to Gisborne. So that's the first time that we were in a full immersion. Um, a cope up on Maori, which was cool, and that we we had done something dabbled with um, kapaka at our primary school, but this was like you know when you go to Gizzy, then they're the real deal. And, and us <laughs> in the big old city, we were just like man, sort of awestruck of like this is next level. And I, being me, didn't like performing or being in front of people, and yeah, mum and dad forced me to do kapaka the first time. <laughs> So, but man, what I found was that that um, experience was still sticks with me to this day around performing. So it was a primary competition. We ended up coming second national in our national. Oh. But 
like for me to be in that space with a lot of my cousins, you know, family, um, but doing it like tuturu, which is like the true way um, in terms of when you learn this bracket, you understand right from the start to the finish what it all means. Um, mm. Not just singing a song or doing a haka, there's stories behind all of these um, parts to the performance and it's all talking about our identity as um, people of that area or people of Aotearoa. So it was a huge experience for me to truly understand what it means to be a part of a kapa um, and kapaka. So, yeah, that was, that was a really cool experience for me. Um, and our, our, um, our uncles in that, they run um, Mauraka Wananga as well. Mm. So um, what would you call that? Like a, like a camp, like a Mauraka camp. And um, they do that out at Almarai and Waikirere. And so it's a week-long um, camp that leads towards learning things like tirako, which is a shorter stick, um, mm. Mauraka, which is with the taiaha. Um, and the thing about that is you have about seven days or so, and for three days at the start, you don't touch a weapon um, because all of the teaching comes from like, the land. Learn about the land first, where you stand, um, and then learn about your body, which connects to the land. And then after that comes, learn about the weapon that comes into your hand connected to your body that's connected to the land. Kind of thing. So the process of weaponry is actually, you know, it starts, does it start with the weapon? It starts for where you're from, who you are, then what you wield. I feel like well, it was a long time ago, but it sort of sticks with you in terms of that's how the indigenous mind works. Mm. It's a bit better than going to war and um, banging it out. But um, yeah, these, um, Things that we learnt at those times, they're, they're things that we got in a week in a, in a camp that was very purposeful for our, our, um, our youth and an opportunity for us to go and learn. But yeah, what I guess I'd love is for it to be a lot more common. I guess like in, I don't know what, like school curriculums and stuff to learn in that way. And that's something we're heading towards, I feel, is to bring back an Indigenous way of learning because um, that resonates with who we actually are um, as Indigenous people um, in a deeper way, yeah. Have you performed that or have you been to Te Matatini or...? Uh... I've been to but haven't performed, no. Yeah, yeah, it's something that's like, yeah, that's like another level up where like I've been so... I guess disconnected for a while that I, it would be a jumping in the deep end. But I know that my younger brother um, would love to perform um, with our younger cousins and nieces and nephews at some point. So I'd love to see that happen. Yeah. That is so cool, man. Um, so you've played for, uh, I mean, you, you've played for a number of teams. I want to, uh, move into rugby. Uh, you play for Canterbury, a uh, provincial rugby, Crusaders Super Rugby. Currently, Hawks Bay. Uh, you're currently one of us, Fika. Uh, you did New Zealand Schoolboys, New Zealand Universities, New Zealand Under Twenties. You were on one of the. Uh, at one time, you were the vice captain. Then you debuted for Manu Samoa this year. Uh, the Crusaders rugby team. You know, it's the most. I mean. It's such a successful franchise, you know, the most successful team in the history of Super Rugby. Man, tell us what it was like to be a part of that, a part of that franchise, that team. Yeah. Nah, um, yeah, as you say, they, they are one of the best, um, you know, arguably, if not the best historically, um, rugby union in the world. Mm. And, um and I look back and I just think I'm so blessed to be to have been in that space, um, rubbing shoulders, going to work with some of the best players in the world um, for about four years. Um, 
and yeah, what what you what you understand about the environment after a while is that it's such a well oiled machine, and the systems that they have in place, they were they were put in place over such a long time with experienced um, players and coaches and what they've put together, it comes from trial and error, failures and successes. And then now they've got a, a program that they've found um, is tried and true. And, and then what they produce, like they, they win, which is, which is what, what their um, process has um, produced over this time. Um, and um, yeah, it's an awesome environment, um, awesome rugby environment that shows you the true, what it means to be a true professional. And um, you know, right from academy all the way through, um, you know, when you start at academy, there's this concept of a Canterbury man um, that they teach us. And it's like the Canterbury man's going to do the one percent, uh, one percenters that no one else wants to do. Um, he will outwork um, their opposition every time. Um, it's a very, yeah, work hard and reap the rewards mindset, which the fact is not everyone's going to enjoy. Mm. And not everyone's going to be able to stay in, which is why by the time they get to the top, then they truly are some of the best. Um, so, yeah, very... Um, successful environment and it was such a blessing to to be a part of it and met so many um, close friends over the time that I was there and still keep in touch which is um yeah it's been awesome as well yeah pretty, pretty cool time of my career down there you know were there times when you were like oh my gosh I'm just fan fan fanboy hard out over here no <laughs> snap you know did you have those moments yeah. Uh, initially, or were you just kind of like snap out of it? Got to, got to, got to do the hard yards, you know. <laughs> happened pretty quick because even when we're in the academy, we we're living across the road. Um, they have academy flats, and so we we're pretty close. And we'd come in, and at the time, we shared the gym with the Crusaders because they were still building their big building. So we had to wait in the players' room, um, and then some. So the Crusaders would be gymming, and we'd be waiting. And then sometimes we'd be cheeky and just walk in as if we thought we were on time. We're like, oh, <laughs> sorry, oh, sorry, Richie, sorry, Dan. Um, meet all the boys and then go out. And, but yeah, definitely had our had our period of like, man, you just see these guys on TV when you're growing up, and then all of a sudden, you know, their lockers right next to you, and um, you know, you actually have to learn how to conversate with people you've been watching on TV for a little while, and it's you know, it's actually different, but. You realise that they're all they're all human and they're all crack up others, and they all just um, enjoy the game as much as you. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Tell us about your debut with Manu Samoa. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that one was that one was different to anything I've experienced. Um, yeah, I think I never I never thought. Never knew how it would feel until I was out there, and um, it was the whole, like that whole dream of I always knew that my papa wanted us to represent Samoa, um, so Dad's dad, and he did a lot with the rugby union in his day, and with refereeing, and um, you know, just building um, the foundation of um, Samoan rugby just tough over there to you know with the resources and access and whatnot that we have over there but so the people who have gone before us to pave the way and give us the opportunity to do this yeah i just thought of my papa when i was out there and i was like man no other team that i've that i've felt this um connection to until i pulled on that jersey um so that one meant the most to me and then um, from that tour, understanding what Test Rugby is all about um, around you never know when you're going to get your next game, you never know when you're going to get called back into the Test Circle. Um, yeah, it truly means that every game counts. And 
yeah, representing um, our Papa and our Samoan heritage is just, yeah, it means the world to me. So I'm looking forward to that tour again and just to make the most of every opportunity I get, just being amongst the boys, um, listening to the language, learning my language again. Um, and then, yeah, also on top of that, playing um, would be a bonus. Yeah. Do you have any game day rituals? You know, like you got to like eat certain foods. You, I don't know, mm. <laughs> got to no, not- hang your shorts a certain way. I don't know. <laughs> that deep but oh um now one thing that i do do is i'll I'll always strap i'll strap my own wrists and thumbs every game so um that's one thing that i've I've done for a few years now um so regardless if i'm late or if i'm early i won't go out to warm up unless i've done my done my wrists and my thumbs and um I guess that's just the process that I quite enjoy because probably got like some sort of minor OCD or something, but <laughs> getting that process perfect for, for myself is like makes me, um, I quite enjoy the process. And then, um, yeah, also probably what I, what I write on my wrist when I, when I play. Um, on the left side, I'll just have my half across, right side um, is A01. And um, that's something that that we got from our Uncle Irani when he was playing in, you know, Caleb Clark uses that as well. And it's actually a lot of athletes around now and it's just audience of one. Mm. Uh, It was always a reminder for us that um, when we go out there to play, um, there's going to be a crowd. um, You've got people following you and supporting you and it's going to be so many people, but... Um, we always know that we play for the audience of one and it's God. So, yeah, always remember that and have to have that reminder for me. And then on the insides of my wrists, on my right side, I have um, Papa, yeah. And then on my left side is Poa, so that's Mum's dad. And that just, that's just my two sides of my family. Yeah, that's probably like the only ritual that I, I would say that I have. Um, yeah, I always pray before I leave the sheds. I always pray under the post before I warm up. And um, yeah, I love to thank the Lord when I finish my games because I've I've had injuries where I I don't walk off. So to be able to walk off the field every time, I just give thanks. Yeah. Is it? Um, what's that feeling like when you uh, see other players come together and pray? Uh, at the end of a game or before a game, um, you know, what is it like to see that and see that, you know, there's no shame in that people just in that space, just really, mm. do you know? Yeah. That no, spiritual connection. It's encouraging, eh? Um, and that's, that's all it is, is um, that fellowship. Fellowship is massively important um, in our faith that, um, where two or more are gathered, um, he is there also. Um, so to be able to connect, especially with boys from other teams, because you don't see them during the weeks or the season, and to share that moment of um, giving thanks to God, um, yeah, it's hugely encouraging for our faith to be able to do that with um, with our brothers. And um, yeah, just to just to normalize and give a space for people to step into. Um, is important because you know if there's no if there's no one else sort of heading into that space then it's quite easy for the ones on the fence just to be like oh no nah, not today mm. um, you know if we open up that space for boys who are keen or have even just been thinking about it lately um, you can provide a space for them to just come and join the circle and um, and just hear the prayer and be like man that was cool and that's a bit of me um, that connection so yeah i've been enjoying seeing seeing it become more common um across teams and across competitions um because yeah encourages boys that you don't have to hide your faith um you can share it with each other um and then yeah that's that's something that we've also um in different environments had um different prayer groups 
and things as teams. And um, that's also a time where where you can just hear from someone else um, who lives the same type of life as you and um, hear about how their journey in faith is. And that's hugely encouraging from, say, like a week-to-week basis of touching base with um, each other and, and sharing your faith. Mm. Mm. You know, uh, you play halfback, and I was wondering, um, have you come up, like, who has been your most challenging opponent, like halfback to play against? You know, like, halfbacks, when you watch again, they look, sometimes they're a bit cheeky, eh? You know, like, <laughs> and I was, I was wondering, like, um, you know, they're just so quick off the mark and stuff. So I was wondering, have you ever come across, like, who has been that opponent where they're just like, oh, this guy, you know, <laughs> good yeah, challenge. It's actually, it's actually quite a funny thing. I think people ask this quite often. And um, there is this sort of rivalry of halfbacks, um, per se, but the, the fact is in, in games, we don't actually get a lot of contact with each other, um, apart from potentially if we're at a scrum and we yeah. start to get cheeky. But um, if I was to say that, it would probably be TJ um, Perinara, where he's got a quick mind and a quicker tongue. So he's quite good with, with talking um, and having a bit of a go there, which is very competitive, which is also fun. Um, but even just so, so on that, it would just be to be able to play against those guys um, and share the field um, is an awesome opportunity in itself. Um, and another one I, was Aaron Smith last year. Um, it was awesome to go up against him too. Yeah. Mm. Did you did you not want to play rugby league or it just nah? Um, we didn't actually grow up with um, a lot of rugby league influence around us. Um, so I don't know why it wasn't really an option um, that we thought of. Um, but there was a time in school where uh, we took our small school to tour to a tournament. And um, we just did it for the experience to have a go. Um, we got smashed because we were still learning <laughs> the game, but it was good fun. And um, yeah, we could we could imagine having a little dabble at some point. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. What makes a great rugby player uh, from your experiences and you know what you've seen in the professional game? Um, yeah. Um. Yeah. Probably. A great rugby player. There's different um, ways to look at that, but someone who's going to play a long time, um, that's consistency. Um, and yeah, consistency can only come with discipline. So yeah, I guess like if, if you're able to be strongly disciplined in your trade um, and consistently doing that, you're going to play for a long time and probably going to play well. Um, and on the other hand, you have, I guess, you know, exciting players who, you know, they might not be around 14 years, but some of the greats where, you know, that part of it comes with talent, but um, the other side of that is also just love, love of the game, yeah. um, enjoyment factor, um, team man. Um, and that's where you get the, the different type of player that's, um, you know, explosively fun and a great player in their own right. Um, yeah, so there's probably like a lot of different ways you could look at that, but you know, some of the greats have been disciplined and consistent and they're just like unreal at their job. Mm. And everyone's just like, man, they just hit it on point every time. And then there's the guy who throws the offload that goes to hand one time and then doesn't go to hand the other time. But when they score those tries, you're just like, right. you never forget that moment. So, oh. space for everyone. <laughs> um, what's your, like, as a rugby player, uh, thinking about, like, you know, watching uh, what has been, like, I don't, like the, the best game of rugby that you've ever watched, like, as a youngster, that most memorable game that you remember? Mm. Um, well, that probably that probably reminds me of when the World Cup was here in New Zealand. We, my brother and I, went and watched Manu Samoa play South Africa, mm. um, and that was a that was actually a really close game. 
um, up until around probably like just you know, 10, 15 minutes after half time. Um, Paul Williams, um, for those who remember him, son of um, Sir BG, Brian Williams, um, put on a pretty good late hit and got red carded. But <laughs> the crowd just went crazy and um, we were like, nah, he's all good, he's all good. <laughs> Yeah, he got red carded, but um, you know, to that that Manu team back then, and you know, all, all the eras um, were really exciting to watch. And um, yeah, so the physicality of those games was pretty up there. And um, to see Manu Samoa competing against um, South Africa, and they could have won that game, yeah, that was pretty exciting. So mm. you know, mm-hmm. knowing like knowing what you know now as a professional um, athlete, rugby player. Uh, what advice would you have given your younger self? Um, hmm. Probably, well, in, in a way, it's just um, enjoy the process um, or like learn to enjoy the process. And so, so for me, that's both when it's going well and when it's not going so well. So you might look at that in terms of selection. So you're playing week to week or not getting selected and you're just training and preparing the team. Um, and it's a tough one because um, you know, in those times where you're not getting selected, it's so tough to enjoy the process. But um, you know, in, in hindsight, the process, you wake up, you go to the gym, um, there's a meeting about the game plan. Um, you're out there training on the field, um, and then you're you're done by the afternoon, and you go for a coffee with the boys, um, and you're planning again. But this is all this is the process, and if you look at that process, you're like, man, what's not to love about that? Mm. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of um, like sort of mental battles that come with um, the rugby um, profession. But if I could have learnt um, earlier how to be content, and it's probably more about content of who of who you are, and then let let your profession sort of be what it is instead of um, affecting how you're feeling about it. So mm-hmm. yeah, enjoy the process and have fun. Um, don't take it for granted. Doesn't mm-hmm. last doesn't last as long as people think. Yeah. You know, I mentioned that interview earlier, that one from 20, 2017, um, and there's a quote in there that says, um, I'm a man of few words. I just do the work to the best of my ability. So now it's 2022. I was wondering, has that changed or is it just still continuing? Is it that consistency still trying to get to that next level of, you know? Mm. Yeah, I'd say like it's it's still true. Um, in general, man, a few words. Um, yet, you know, every now and then I could, if it's something I'm passionate about, then that it stop me rambling sometimes. But um, I think in, in this stage of my career, you know, back then I was just um, head down and do the work because mm. that's where I was at. I had to. You know, I was I was young and going into these environments with um, weathered professionals, and I just needed to go and work hard. And you know that that still stands now, but it's in the space that I'm in with places like Moana, Pacifica, and um, Manusa Moa. For me, at this stage, it's it's more about the organisation and the people we represent when we play as opposed to me furthering my career per se. I think just my priority has changed um, in the past six years. And that's something I I found when I moved from Christchurch up to here is that, you know, it's actually not about me anymore. Um, It's about, you know, that that one um, young Samoan boy who might be watching me um, in whatever I do. I do everything for him or for her. Um, yeah, it's for my faith and what I represent. 
um, what I do has to reflect that. Um, yeah, it's not about me anymore. It's about um, what I what I'm sowing into uh, for others. I think, yeah. Yeah, I think you answered, you might have answered a bit of what my next question was going to be because uh, we were moving into Moana Pacifica and you were the second player to sign with the team. Uh, so the question was, what were some of those factors that contributed to you making that decision to join uh, the franchise? But I think you might have really like, touched upon um, just some of the important, significant uh, reasons. Yeah. Not about you, but more about... Yeah, yeah. That's probably is the just day. Like at that stage of my career, I was, um, I was ready to look at options, and I was ready for experience potentially to go to Japan. Um, I, I love the country, I love the culture. Really, a place that I'd like to play at some point. But um, you know, I was in that space where I could have gone either way, and what brought me back here was, um. It was Sir Michael Jones' vision for what the team, uh, what it is um, really built for, um, like the vision that he has for for the team really is. It's not not necessarily to be another competitive. Like it will be a competitive um, Super Rugby team, mm. um, but it's about providing a space, providing an environment that can also um, give you the chance to learn more about you as wherever you're from, Samoa, Tongan, Māori, Fijian, and then work from that space. Um, go out into your community, um, truer to who you are than you were before. Um, and we can only get that if we prioritize um, you know, our cultural side and our professional side sort of um, simultaneously. Whereas um, you know, most environments, they will give time, uh, PD blocks maybe twice a week or so, where you can go and do your own thing or do some learning and whatnot. But I think the vision for what we have here is to be able to live our culture day to day as opposed to drip feeding it every now and then, which would be an awesome um, sort of perfect world for us. Mm. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, for me, it's really, you know, to come back to Moana, it's, it's, it's more about, you know, doing my part to serve um, this, this um, journey of, of whatever it is um, going to end up being. But, yeah, do my part to be able to serve um, our people and provide a platform for our youth to aspire to. Mm. Why is it important that we have Moana Pacifica, we have the team, the Fijian team, you know, why is it important that uh, they are part of the Super Rugby competition? I know there's been talk for years and finally it, it happened. Yeah. Yeah, probably one part to look at is like... Um, just the island's contribution to rugby worldwide. Hey, um, just from, you know, you look at the All Blacks team and how many of them uh, have Pacific um, background and roots. Um, if you look at the Australian team, Wallabies, mm -hmm. huge percentage of them who are either Samoan, Tongan or on the islands. And um, I guess this having having the Moana Pacifica and Fijian Lua in competition is just acknowledging the contribution that our island nations have made with players, to put it simply. And um, But what it, what it helps with is to bring, uh, to bring resource and um, exposure to those back in the islands. Mm. The, the main goal really is to help to um, develop back home, back in Samoa, um, the systems, academies, and things to give the kids back at home the opportunity to grow in their talent that they that they have, instead of having to move um, from their family to find the opportunity 
it's to acknowledge what what we bring to the table and um, put resource back into the island nations that give so much to world rugby. Hmm. You know, I was thinking about senior leadership um, at Moana Pacifica uh, in the team, you know, the, the players. Are you considered, uh, because of teams that you've played in, uh, a mentor or a leader to other players? Or is it is it age-wise? Is it experience-wise? How does mentorship work in, in Moana Pacifica? Yeah, there's a, there's a bit, of, bit of both. Um, I know that last year it sort of started with you know there's there's age and experience so some of some of us had so you had the Christian Lili Funnels, Seko Pekepus and you know they huge experience over in Australia with um, international rugby and things like that. You have Jack Lamb, um, she had huge experience with Super Rugby here and also with Mansa Moa, um, and then. Uh, me on the other hand was experienced down in Crusaders, which is not a long time, but um, that environment down there, as I spoke to earlier, and then you know there's boys like um, Henry Taifu, um, Tomasi Alosio, and then a wide range across the board that have experience in other places as well, in terms of um, either culturally um, or just them as 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 individuals as leaders that have the, the tools to, to lead our team. But um, I think what we try to get to in, in our Moana culture is it's more of a village um, mentality around, we're not, uh, there's no leadership above um, looking down um, mm. amongst, we're side by side and you know, the conversations we try to have with each other are completely genuine and open so that you know we're not trying to um, there's no hierarchy. We don't want a hierarchy in our team. Um, yeah, we want us to be able to split off into smaller units in our village and have um, open and honest talanoa with each other. Um, and then there's the assistance for us to feed it forward and feed it up. Yeah. Mm. You know, our NPC season uh, for Hawks Bay uh, has wrapped up. Wait. Did I box it? It's wrapped up, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's wrapped up. Okay, so season is wrapped up. Otskare some of this. Otskare. Um, how much? How much time downtime do you get now? Uh, to rest. Like, how much downtime do you get before you start preseason with Moana Pacifica, or are you just straight into uh, training for that now? Um, so since the season finished, then we had about two two and a half weeks off, and um, yeah, there, there's always options for us to come in and train with whoever's around, but um, also the option to go and just relax for a bit. Mm. So we've yeah we've taken a bit of that time to just um, switch off, take a week or so, and then when you feel like you need it, come back in and rejoin. Um, and then so the Samoa tour leaves on Saturday, which is a few days away. So, yeah, we're almost back into it. And then, um, yeah, we'll be on for a month. And then again, we should have around two and a, two and a bit weeks to get back into it. Yeah. Oh, busy, busy, busy. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to talk about financial literacy um, because I was wondering, uh, you know, as you were coming through, like, representative like age group teams you know with with uh, New Zealand uh, were they educating you know young folks on financial literacy and uh, you know contracts and things like that or is that yeah where do you learn about that as a uh, young professional athlete coming through the system hmm. yeah the, the New Zealand rugby um, union has has systems in place in terms of like the professional development sessions. Um, they're not um, very often, um, that's the word, but so, you know, it's actually something that you have to, you have to take control of if, if you're really gonna learn about it. Um, so they'll potentially come in once or twice um, in a season and give you a, a lecture around it. And then, then it's up to the players to go in action 
if they want to catch up or which um to be fair doesn't happen as often as it probably should the catch-ups and actual learning um which i think especially for island players you know they probably don't relate completely with um a banker coming in and talking mm. about all these concepts that they probably didn't learn in school or have a full, full idea about um and i think you know potentially it's it's a huge space for um uh, polynesian financial advisors or people in that area of expertise to speak into because like as we know there's so much more to finance for uh, Polynesian people um, in terms of whala of or mm -hmm. sending money here or there where it's not as simple as saving. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, in my time, in my career, I haven't heard of anyone who is able to speak into that space from a professional rugby point of view and how to steward your money to do that the best way to um, also cater to your cultural needs. So I think that's a huge space that is um, that has potential to be filled at some point and should be. Yeah. Mm. You know, uh, you're so early, you're 25 years of age, uh, you know, so young player uh, with a lot of experience as, you know, in, in rugby. But I was wondering, uh, you know, what are some of the, the things that you're working towards uh, to make sure that you and uh, your um, family, you know, maintain financial stability or sustain it uh, in the future? Like, uh, do you uh, dabble in, like, I mean, do you invest money? You know, that kind of stuff. I was just wondering, you know, uh, you know, just for other uh, young players or athletes who may, who may be watching, you know, like, get some tips. Or <laughs> I think, um, like, I'm not the most financially literate <laughs> person, like, but um, I've had I've had huge support around me, um, which um, is yeah the huge reason why I'm in a stable space with my finances and, and things like that. And um, so probably the first thing for me is to find people who you trust um, to be able to talk to you about your money and how to go about it. Um, that's the first thing that if you're taking advice from people that you trust, then um, at least you're starting from the right place. Mm. Um, so we had a financial um, advisor that was working with my parents for a long time. Um, and when I started to um, get into my professional contracts and things like that, then I was at a position where I needed to um, steward that well and not waste it. Um, so, we worked with him and he put a plan together uh, for us and um, I guess the biggest thing that he taught me was to um, get to know where every dollar is going. Um, so there's a plan for, you know, you, you've got um, travel savings, you've got your investments over here and then you've also got, I'm going to buy maybe like three lunches this week so I'm going to know where that goes. Mm. So. Knowing where your money is going is a big one, so that's budgeting. Um, but yeah, I guess in terms of um, making the most of um, my income these days, is like the understanding that, um, like, as a rugby player, you make the most of your money when you're playing, right? So, and for most rugby players, that's from when you're young. Mm. Kids out of school, 19, 19 to late twenties. So it's important to um, you know, be, be safe with your money and um, you know, don't waste it early because um, invest early and save early so that at the back end when you, know, when you have to decide what else you want to do, um, have the understanding that you won't make as much as what potentially what you made at the start. So for me, um, one simple thing that we do with our advisor is um, investing in managed funds, which is a safe form of investment that's long term. Because mm. for me, things like Bitcoin and that, it's a little bit over my head. So, yeah, only get into that stuff if you're keen to learn um, the ins and outs. 
Uh, were you, you were studying commerce at uh, Lincoln University. Were you able to uh, finish your studies or is that still an ongoing uh, goal? Yeah, I, I didn't end up finishing that at the time because, uh, yeah, I was part-time for a, a while. And, um, yeah, what I found was that after three or so years, I had done about six papers and that was to fit around my rugby schedule. Um, so the learning actually wasn't sinking in and you know, I was forgetting things that I did last year or all that stuff. So, yeah, I found it better to just put it on hold for a bit. Um, I still have about nine papers, which could be done in a, in a full year with the summer school or something like that. So um, still an option and I'll keep that open for sure. That um, If I have the opportunity to finish that off, then I can get around to it. So, you know, outside of rugby, uh, you, you you have a life outside of rugby, um, yes. as is, you do, you're, you know, you're keen on surfing, you do photography, reading, yay, uh, crocheting, yes. uh, you play the guitar, you're involved in your church community, fellowship, prayer groups, mm. man, uh, in terms of balance, you know, rugby life and life outside of rugby, how is that balance for you? Yeah, um, balance is hugely important. And um, with that list of hobbies, um, probably like the, the saying for me, very common saying is um, that old um, jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> so, <laughs> doesn't mean that I'm great at many of them. But, um, definitely a lot of things like capture my attention in terms of like uh, so crochet, um, learn to crochet. Um, a couple of years ago, just something really simple. And it's um, just in the process of making like a, a throw or little blanket. Um, mm. This is something I do in my spare time when I feel like it. Um, guitar is something that I would just love to be good at um, at some point. And it's another thing that takes time. Um, but I actually do quite enjoy um, learning a song or two here and there. Um, Surfing is probably um, one of the one of the biggest parts of, of my off field. Um, so especially living in Hawke's Bay was was unreal because um, so many options of spots to surf and um, yeah, it's such a therapeutic um, sport and hobby, and it's also a lifestyle mm. as well. And I think that a lot of um, people would enjoy if they got to know it and opens up so many opportunities, um, whether it's just um, wanting to drive from here to Raglan, like, why not just go to the waves and go to the beach and it's always going to be good. Um, yeah, but yeah, a few hobbies that sort of um, keep me keep me occupied and yeah, not a field space. Have you, um, do you do the, have you tried the Samoan Ingi? You know, I, you know? Yeah, no. I, I I must I think I saw a quick video on it and I didn't watch it, but I will now. <laughs> there you go. There's a challenge for you, yeah. <laughs> a goal to work towards. Um, list, but that'll be on the list. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and don't forget to post the photo when you finish making that throw that you're working on. <laughs> Man, my, I mean, my students last year, my seniors led a, um, a crochet club and they were making cool, les, like, cool stuff. Like, you know, obviously, you know, like, um, just, you know, teenagers and just, like, cool teddy bears and things like that. And uh, one of my students was amazing, and I said to her, "You know, you could sell this stuff, make an Instagram page, you know, get get promoting, you know, promoting your work." So when I yeah. saw crocheting on your list, I was like, "Hey, oh, this guy, okay, 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 we see you." <laughs> Some of my cousins are actually really good, and they make they've made jumpers and oh. things like that. So, yeah, solid as you know. Um, oh, I want to ask this, say, because I remember seeing this video on your page. Like, you know, for photographers or vloggers, uh, what must have equipment do you think from, you know, in your opinion, should they invest in? Like, are you that guy who has a couple of drones? And uh, <laughs> Well, yeah. So, so I've, got, I've got a camera and, um, I, yeah, I got that a few years ago and 
um, that's really fun just to dabble here and there. And um, yeah, so I like um, surf photography and I haven't actually learned how to use the camera like to its full capacity, but that's a goal of mine, which would be cool. Um, and yeah, I got a drone uh, last year uh, and just before Christmas. And um, yeah, if you want to check out its lifespan, it's in a short uh, minute clip on my Instagram because I, I flew it um, a couple of weeks ago and um, it went flat and drowned. <laughs> there you go, fam. Uh, check out the <laughs> check Make out sure the video. <laughs> check your battery before you fly and don't try to take out the video when it tells you to come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's crack up, bro. Um, so you know, no matter. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely worth it because the quality of film that you can get like it's pretty unreal. Yeah, camera and yeah. drone, top two. Yeah, yeah I saw. I saw that. I was like, yo. This is cool as, but then I remember I forgot a jump. So <laughs> didn't mean to bring up, you know, those sad memories. So, my bad. <laughs> um, you know that, you know, no matter where we go, uh, there's always that belief that the prayers of our families, our communities, villages, you know, the churches that we belong to, that they are with us just in everything that we do. So how has that love and support um, from the different communities that you are a part of, how has that helped to keep you grounded uh, throughout this journey uh, of being a professional a rugby player? Yeah, it's, it's huge, um, especially knowing that, that people are praying. Um, um, that's a huge comfort in everything that we do, that we don't go alone, um, that we have, you know, we have covering over us all the time. Um, that old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And it's so true that um, fellowship and community holds you together. And when you fall, it picks you back up. Um, so, yeah, we are so blessed um, to have the community and family that we have and you know, friends as well is a huge part of that. Um, and yeah, uh, our our church here at, based in Calston, um, CCF, and you know all of our my generation of you know our our kids who grew up there, um, we have this thing where we we look at so all of our parents they're they're our giants, and you know we always when we have the opportunity to catch up we're like man, aren't we blessed to have the giants that we have in our lives because we can always look at them and. They set the example of a Christ-like faith, and um, yeah, so we're pretty blessed. And yeah, community and prayer, um, yeah, you can't really top it because it, it holds you together for sure. Mm. You know, I want to ask about social media. Um, do like, for example, at Moana Pacifica, uh, is there education? Uh, around how to deal with the media, uh, how to look after your your public image, for example, you know, your social media accounts or be mindful about what you say or uh, knowing what brands to put your name to and whatnot. Do you know, is there a conversation around that or is it kind of like every man for themselves? I was just wondering, like, for example, when you were at the Crusaders, were they educating young people? players on that or just yeah. players in general um yeah definitely new zealand rugby have a um protocols i guess um with um people in, in place to give you that edu education um and it's and it's very simple and straightforward and they cover all the bases that you need um in terms of you know be careful what you post um even be careful who you let to follow you or who you follow. Um, yeah, there's so much to it, and especially this day and age where social mm -hmm. media is so huge, um, a lot of it has to be common sense in terms of what you post and whatnot. But um, yeah, our our professional environments, our rugby environments, do give us those um, reminders on you know just be careful because you know a lot can actually happen. Um, on social media that can hinder you as a person and you know what do you call it um uh, 
uh, misunderstandings so easy to happen online and so yeah especially for our young players um they get they get the full rundown of this could happen that could happen so just be careful um but it is a it's a platform that can be so good and also completely on the other end as well if you're not careful yeah mm. and it can be detrimental to your health to your yeah. mental health you know like in this day and age of cancel culture and stuff like that you know yeah yeah it's something that like you know, me and my friends have been in conversation about and on and off social media you know you have those times where you have a break or mm. whatnot and then there's also the conversation like do we even you know should we even stay on it because you know to be fair there's a lot of rubbish mm. um you know we consider that and then as players also like there's there's the potential to influence as well and I guess we just have to manage um, sort of that space in terms of I really want to reach out to you know youth who follow me in terms of my content um, in a positive way mm. to be a positive influence on social media but on the other hand there's a lot of um, rubbish that is just sort of fed into my feed that affects me so how do we find that balance of this is a good platform but it's also can be a negative platform at the same time but um yeah i'm sure i'm sure we'll find a balance otherwise um just delete the app and move on with you <laughs> carry on as you do um and do you find it challenging um to you know when you're out in public if, i mean if people recognize you as are you are you cool with that do you like meeting fans or is it sometimes just very overwhelming uh, what have been your experiences around that mm. I'm, pr I'm probably i'm probably in like the perfect medium of recognition to non-recognition um mm. in terms of you know when i'm in public it might just be one or two and when it is like that or you know you just appreciate it because there are people who follow you and support and um, the funny thing is that us Moana boys actually have, we got swarmed a bit more in Fiji, which is, you know, not in New Zealand where we actually mm. live and play, <laughs> which is awesome because then we know, you know, that's where our fan base is and those are the people who truly connect with our, our journey. And, um, yeah, we, we really do appreciate, or I do appreciate meeting people who follow our journey and who support us from afar. Um, when they let us know that they're watching, they've been watching our career, then yeah, very grateful because that support and you know, we hear we hear their support from home when we get to finally, you know, meet them for that one second. So yeah, I think it's really important for me to um make sure that I give time um to people who approach me because um I remember I was in that space once where you know, I probably wasn't confident enough to go and say hi, but um you know, it does mean a lot um, to people who get to watch you on TV because, you know, it is, I guess, this different world that we we live in and this sort of world of um, you know, TV and, you know, people get disconnected sometimes and think that we're just over there, but um, we actually do like to um, be relational and mm. say hi and have a conversation because, yeah, we appreciate support from everywhere. And then in terms of self-care, like self-care, um, how do you, what, what do you do for self-care? Uh, I, I mean, I know you've, obviously you've got hobbies and you try and find that balance between your professional and then life outside of rugby. Are there other things that you do to uh, take care of your mental health or well-being, wellness? Um, just, um, just recently been reading a lot more which um, went through a real dip during my high school years, heading into university where I didn't read a lot. Um, but I guess being more intentional about what I'm reading has been cool and you know, learning more about my faith, but also about uh, even history, New Zealand history, which we can touch on later. But putting my phone down is a good start. So. Um, minimizing what social media apps I even have is a is a huge um, declutter of my mental space, and then that opens up time for things that 
um, are going to add to me um, in terms of it might be reading or it might be one of my hobbies that um, I can just have a dabble in now that I have the time. So, um, yeah, recently learning how to free up my time so that I can fill it with things that um, are actually meaningful has been actually quite a fun process. And yeah. Another thing I sometimes like to do is just go for a drive, um, put a board on, on my roof and um, drive to a beach. And if there's waves, it's cool, but if not, then it's nice to be on the coast. So yeah, I don't know how I would do in a place where I can't get to the beach in less than an hour and a half. I think I'd go crazy. <laughs> less than an hour and a half it's like an hour like if i get the beach here it's like an hour on the train and people are like an hour on the train what and i'm like but it's honestly the train ride the it's so worth it eh? because you just get there and it's like yo it's yeah. just so refreshing it's just to be near the ocean and i mean it's just it's all worth it i would yeah. do that as as much as i need to to go and be in just a real calm space environment where I just disconnect <laughs> from everything. And I guess your radius increases depending on where you're living, eh? So I say an hour and a half only because I'm in Auckland and that's literally how long it takes. So. Oh, yeah, how, how, true that. Oh, yeah, true that, true that. Because it's probably different when you live further down, you know, yeah. Central North Island, stuff like that. Yeah, that's so true, Auckland, man. But yeah, I know, like in Auckland, I remember like just growing up that drive out to, the beaches it was never like it was never a bother because it was like yay we're going to the beach you know it was yeah. always the beach trip the church <laughs> beach trip <laughs> <laughs> always the buzz you know always the exciting thing to do yeah. um you know you mentioned reading and do you prefer uh, do you listen to all audio books uh or do you prefer to hold a book mm. do you read ebooks online or audio books and that um but like, so when yeah, I'm reading, I like to have the real deal, which is mm. nice. I haven't, um, I've been interested in Kindle just because of how um, convenient it is. But yeah, also that thing of it's nice to have the book and turn the page kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Are you um, a bit of bit of each or more? Yeah, I, I, because uh, I commute, so I, I enjoy audio books, uh, but with the, like I actually didn't get into audiobooks. Like it's only been a few years since I s listened to my very first audiobook, and that was Trevor Noah's book. Um, uh, so I read the book, then I read I read the ebook, then I had to get the real book, <laughs> yeah. then I listened to the audio because you know I love his comedy and like I love his he skits does, and he, stuff. He read his own book. Mm. In the yeah oh bro i recommend that he reads so that was the reason like when i was reading like i read the ebook and i was like okay gotta get the real book as i was reading the real book and if you know his you know his skits and stuff yeah. you just gotta hear it so i i had to get the audio book and then i listened to it and read it as well it's just a whole nother level of funny eh? like you uh, just gotta hear the jokes so yeah. when it comes to audiobooks like i like to listen to it if it's the person if it's the author yeah. So a lot yeah. of it is memoirs. I listen to a lot of like memoirs, like biography, that kind autobiography, that kind of stuff. Uh just it's like the connection. I've said this before, it's just like it's more intimate, it's a whole nother level. You can hear the you know, like when you read the words on paper, it's it's you know, you're trying to think, you know, what was the author thinking at this time when they wrote this, but when you hear them read it. It's like a whole nother level of emotional connection. I know that's serious as a, but. <laughs> to me, because I was, I was thinking audio books, you know, it's usually, you know, some, some random voice over the book, but if it's the author, then that would make a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, um, with, there are a, a lot of books which are not, um, yeah, it's random. They're voice actors, you know, they're like, yeah, yeah. It's a whole job, man. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I'll listen to it and I'm like, oh, I can't, the accent, man. Mm. Oh, this person sounds boring as, but it's like an action scene. And, the, you know, it's like, what? So I, I definitely am real particular with the type of audiobooks I listen to. But because I commute, I also have Kindle. So I have a whole collection. Um, 
yeah and then every now and then like recently i've just finished a few books that i actually held and read just just yeah. because it was the mood <laughs> um yeah hmm. if, if a book was written about you uh written about your life what would what do you think that book would be called oh. um Yeah, that's a tough question. Have you have you made one yet? Have, uh, have I thought about that question for myself? Probably, yeah. probably. Uh, actually, no, I have. I'm just like procrastinating right now, um, <laughs> just beating around the bush. But yeah, um, I think if a book was written about me, maybe it would be Miss understood like miss because like as a teacher you know, i'm an educator mm -hmm. and then just under misunderstood as in like i don't know i just like in different spaces that i work in i just i don't know i think i always feel like i'm just misunderstood <laughs> like i know that sounds like sounds uh, back, but <laughs> that's something that i'd like to get to a title similar to that because i was i was thinking like ah. Oh, it would be something just like, just to represent that I'm just sort of like thinking, but I should just say it. So like the yeah. the title can't be something just like, like mm, <laughs> then something. I don't know. Yeah, like, something. Dot yeah. dot dot. Because that's just how kind of how my mind works sometimes. I'm just like, don't know whether to say it. And then I just say mm. it. Yeah, I think the whole. Um, yeah I, I so i get that eh? like so for me it's like when i'm in the like when i'm in the classroom like i'm a whole like you would not know that i'm an introvert like actually doing this podcast is so out of my comfort zone bro you wouldn't even believe it like it's just but i'm really truly an introvert like mm -hmm. depending on the spaces that i'm in i have to sometimes really build up and try and find that energy to be in a space yeah. so i think it's like that's what it is i'm always like if i'm in a teacher space then i'm looking at who is like if i'm at a professional development like who are the voices there who are the, like i'm always like thinking about the spaces that i'm in and uh being intentional what should i be saying what shouldn't i be saying who are the people in the room reading yeah. the room but actually i just like quiet time quiet space. like i'm just yeah, yeah. Like you wouldn't know it if you saw me in the classroom. I'm not. Mm. Yeah. Like even this, my friends are like, but you do a podcast. I'm like, oh, it's just, I don't know. I don't know. It's just it's something about this space connecting with like amazing people that really inspire me, you know, in the different fields that they're working in, just the goals that they're smashing and mm how they're being impactful and intentional in the different spaces and communities that they're in, like that totally gets me amped because yeah. it always reminds it's like a reminder for me to be like just be better at what i do kind of thing yeah but on the other hand i'm just kind of like really just uh i just yeah. enjoy quiet time <laughs> i'm just a real introvert like you wouldn't even know anyways it's not about me cut it up yeah that's a um huge <laughs> in terms of like introverts it's probably like i don't i don't i wonder if there's much um not teaching but like no support or conversation around how to step into social spaces really well and then also you know be your sit back and yeah. chill stuff because i i also feel like my social batteries quite it's like an iphone 6 it will just deplete like as soon as you walk into the room but like in terms of what you're saying around like reading the room who's there especially if you're speaking yeah um, and you're you're all constantly thinking who's listening am i still entertaining or like yeah. am i catching the whole room or are they bored or are they bored it's like um because you're aware of that all stuff when you're when you're not actually that's not actually your space that you love really hard it's like anxiety man like i have anxiety anxiety levels are like hit all time high like mm -hmm. this year uh, a new role that i have at school i've had to present uh and i'm just like 
because we still wear masks at school like it's a thing and I'm like every time I fit, I'm always like damn why didn't I bring my asthma pump oh my god am I gonna faint am I gonna collapse right here they're gonna have to remind me like honestly it's like anxiety is a whole nother level of like I just I'm try just trying to like present get out of there and my friends like you you have a podcast like just think just it's like you're doing your podcast I'm like no because the people looking at me are like <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, reading the room, yeah. anyways. <laughs> yeah. I find it hard to um, keep. So I'll come in with a prepared the train of thought, and then, you know, when you enter that space, then it kind of just shoots yeah. out the back. But yeah, I guess like when you're intentional with what you know you want to give, then yeah, you just hope it comes back. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on it, still working on it. <laughs> um so book recommendations bro like i know i know you've you, you said you've been reading uh mm. hit us hit us with those book recommendations or book recommendation that you might I've, have with you i've got a couple here um i will start with this one it's probably backwards but it's called crazy love um I've got this one from a um from a second hand shop which is nice but um this one is about um, coming back to your first true love, and that's God, and remembering what He did for you, and living a life postured towards that. You know, uh, I guess in faith sometimes we get into a religious cycle of just doing what we need to do to be good, when really it's about you know doing what we need to do to get closer um, to our to the person who loves us, so we can love Him. That's crazy love. And that's just a mean book for me that I've loved. Um, and the one that I've recently been reading is this one. I just finished it, Huya Come Home. And then this one is uh, it's a it's gold mine for history. Um, so it's Aotearoa history, but also the history of Christianity in, in Aotearoa, which um, not a lot of people know, and like I didn't really know until I read this book also. And it's so part of it talks about um, the Treaty of Waitangi and the roles that the missionaries played opposed to what we know of what the colonizers played in the treaty. So it's the treaty, history of um, the gospel, but also um, the the faith-driven life of Māori Indigenous people before the gospel came from overseas. Um, and then, yeah, it, it covers a lot, but it's it's just mostly goes through the story of colonisation and when the missionaries came, but also that there was faith in the land before text and mm. church and all these structures came to our land. So... It's quite interesting because it just gives you the indigenous, it reminds you that there is an indigenous um, worldview and there is a Western worldview that the majority of us actually live from nowadays because that's what we've been taught and that's our school curriculum and all of that stuff is in that way. But yeah, it talks about, it's a reminder to say, you know, you have an indigenous worldview and the history tells us that that was rooted in faith. Um, and it comes back to that whole thing of Mauraku, that it starts with the land and the people, and then it goes through. So, yeah, I found that quite interesting um, in terms of just reminding myself, how can I tap back into my Indigenous worldview and um, keep what I've learned from my Western um, learning and then put it together? Mm. But yeah, it's a, it's quite an insightful book in, in our history here in Aotearoa. Yeah, and it, it connects it connects to um, like podcasts I've heard recently about um, say the Middle East mm. um, because the Middle East um, say the Jewish um, worldview is very similar to the Indigenous Maori, and I'd say very similar to Samoan as well. Um, compared to their Western um, influence was the Greek. And then that's where, um, you know, the Bible comes into uh, uh, Greek 
structure and translations go and go and go. But the original text, I guess, was, you know, it was Eastern. Um, so I compare Eastern to Māori because that's indigenous, indigenous. Um, and when you learn about these, I've been learning about these things and how they correlate in terms of how you see the world. The Eastern, Middle Eastern lens of how they see the world and land, for example, is relationship. Relationship first over facts, which is like awesome to get back to. Um, because, you know, when you start with relationship, then what you what you learn from there, um, I feel, becomes more meaningful. Um, yeah. And I, I see you had a question about Hakka as well, potentially. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I was wondering, um, I did, I did have a question about um, looking at it from a global context, you know, that, you know, Hakka is being performed globally now. Uh, uh, sometimes it's being performed in, I don't, I don't want to say like the right spaces because other times people are just kind of like, it looks like dalahaka kind of like, I, I want to talk about like, uh, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on that because just the significance of haka, what it represents to tangata whenua, but just that it seems like Globally, everyone's just kind of like going for it. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of think of it sometimes as well. And <clears throat> it's kind of like reminded me of like just recently sort of, I guess when you, when you think of haka and sports, um, like, yeah, on one hand, it's, it's awesome that we are embracing the culture of our land and then and it's such a positive thing for for our culture to have our our national teams um, representing us on the world stage like that and then i think just like within those um frameworks of or those organizations i feel it's really important for them to you know fully teach what the haka means um who wrote it Know, where was it from or who was it written to and for um because for example if the all blacks use you know come up there for a rugby game um you know it's a story of a maori chief running from um you know say another tribe and um and hiding under a woman because that's the tapu space that another person, man can't come and search under, or for example, and then you know you have the All Blacks doing this haka. Do they actually know what the story was? You know, because you know, haka is so. Um, what I was thinking was haka is spiritual. Mm. Haka and waiata and things like that. They they're actually spiritual, like um, this concept of ihi. So ihi is like an essence within um, within people that is it's the connection between tangible and non-tangible, physical and spiritual. So that's ihi that comes out when you haka. And um everyone feels that. Like if everyone if anyone's done a haka before, um, especially in a big say um moment or occasion, you feel this like Ihi come out of you, which is like emotional and raw, and that's spiritual. So I think the importance of haka is to, you know, whenever you perform a haka, I feel like you know if you're going to get deep about it, it's like, do you know what that haka means? Like, do you know what's coming out of your mouth? Because that's truly important as well. So the heart in which you perform that haka should represent what that haka is saying not just the occasion that you're doing it at mm -hmm. so we have like um, weddings um, funerals rugby games sports 
and we have haka used at all of those. But the interesting thing I, I feel sometimes is that you know, it might not actually be appropriate sometimes, depending on also like depending on what the haka is or what the occasion is. Mm. But the, probably the most important thing I've been thinking is do you know why you are doing the haka and what it means? Because they hold a lot more than just shouting words. It's history and genealogy and identity in these um, haka and waiata that have been composed for certain purposes. Mm. Um, yeah, no, I, I've, the, the reason why I had that question there was because, um, you know, like sometimes like you'll see clips online from American football games uh, or school games where they just kind of break out in a haka. It is an ongoing conversation and I think like, yeah, the reality is not everyone's going to consider everything mm. before they do something. So. You know, some people are going to be on the hard side of like, never haka if you don't know what you're doing. Before. <laughs> be like, oh, do a haka because it's nice and like, I like it. Um, but um, yeah, there's going to be everything in between as well. But I think I guess where I'm at right now is like, yeah, should know why and what it's about. And I, that challenges me as well in terms of I've been feeling that way at different occasions and people are like, oh, should we haka, should we haka? And I'm like, actually, maybe not. <laughs> because like back like a few years ago I'm like yo that's us and like, we're just like wow yeah maybe there's something it is a space to be a bit more like um, respectful of yeah as we learn more about it yeah mm. um, do you have any future dreams uh, uh, any dreams uh, that you're still uh, looking forward to pursuing uh after rugby or future aspirations? Um, well, like probably like with my rugby in the next however long I've got, I, I do want to go and experience overseas. Um, and that'll happen um, wherever, wherever that ends up happening. And so that's more about experience for me. I would like to experience other cultures and things like that. Um, I think probably like post rugby, in terms of my big picture plan for me is that I don't have too much detail to. So I'd like to be, um, I guess, financially free in terms of post rugby so that I'll have my time available to serve really. Um, and what that looks like to me, I'm not sure yet, but um, you know, whether that's charities or youth or um, even potentially things that my friends have going or I might start something myself, um, something I'm passionate about. But um, the main goal is to, you know, for now until I finish is to buy my time so that I can use it to, to serve others. Because how I look at my career really is um, it's, it's actually quite selfish to be honest, like doing this job, um, you know, it's very true that people say you're living the life and like, yeah, yeah, in a way we're living the life, but also it's, it's quite a selfish life in terms of, you know, we're doing what we love and um, we have to try and give back as much as we can in between, but you know, I, I, want, I want to eventually have time to give um, freely whenever and for two, two things that are important in my life at that time. So, yeah, I'm hoping that's a next 10 years goal that I can sort of do that well and then stop making it all about me, myself and my. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, Fred, this, is, this has been awesome, eh? Like, seriously. Um, you know, we're 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 at the part of the show where we, uh, you know, we're we're wrapping up. I, I really just wanted to say, um, Ede, thank you, bro, for coming through today. Um, thank you for all the gems that you've dropped uh, for sharing your knowledge um, and just your journey. 
you know, it's it's always uh, it's not easy to come into a space that is quite new. And um, I hope that uh, in today's salanoa or kōrero, you're able to take something valuable away. <laughs> Um, I yeah, I appreciate you coming through to share parts of your story, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to follow your journey. Uh, you know, as a professional rugby player, um, yeah, all the best for um, Wana Pasifika with the new season coming up, and just for the remainder of the year. I hope that you are able to enjoy your downtime away from the sport uh, mm -hmm. before you get back into training, and um, yeah. Uh, Godspeed, and just just keep keep inspiring our young people, uh, and keep being the best you that you can be. Um, I'll give you an opportunity now just to uh, drop some final words of encouragement, uh, just for our audience, for our listeners, just for anyone out there who might be needing um, some uplifting words. Mm. <laughs> Oh, yeah, first of all, thank you, Rosa, for having me. Um, yeah, made my first podcast experience a positive one. Um, and I think it's been a long time for me to decide to actually do a podcast because, you know, I guess as introverts, we value what we think. So we don't want to say too much, et cetera. But, um, in terms of being ready to share, um, yeah, I think this has been, you know, God's timing that um, it's now. And so I appreciate that um, you've given this platform for me to share and to tell a know with you um, because, yeah, intentionality is is very key to um, wanting to open up in the first place. So, yeah, appreciate um, everything that you do in, in your podcast and, and the co-papa that you have because it's all very um, uplifting um, stuff, especially for um, our people, which is awesome. So thank you, for starters. Um, yeah, and just for people listening or watching, I guess, is from my perspective in my life at the moment, um, the, the best thing that I've done is um, you know, push into my relationship with, um, with God because there's been a lot of uh, decisions that I've had to make um, in my life and people make decisions in their life, but you know, regardless of if they go well or wrong, as long as I know I've got somewhere to come back to and you know, as, as you learn in faith, he's in here um, because he sacrificed um, himself to leave Holy Spirit with us. So this is a relationship that I carry um, everywhere that I go. Um, and yeah, the peace that God gives is a gift that the world cannot give. Um, that's uh, John 14, 27, I believe. It's one of my favorite verses. So, might be Luke. Might be <laughs> um, yeah, that's me. And, um, yeah, thank you again. It's been, uh, been unreal. And um, hopefully I'll see you over in Japan at some point. 